against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. But the last clause of the 12th verse says, but our eyes are upon thee. Say amen to the reading of the word today. And I ask that you would just share this topic with your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, the eyes have it. Now you gotta you gotta you gotta say it like this. You got when you say the eyes have it, when you get to that word eyes, you gotta make your eyes real big, like to emphasize the word. So look and get get locked in with your neighbor real quick and tell them tell them the, the topic today. You gotta say, the eyes have it. Lord, we thank you this morning. We ask God that as you open your word to us, that we would open our hearts to you to receive. And as we've spoken already, let us not just react in the moment, but let it build momentum that will carry into our lives from henceforth. We give you praise in advance for what you're getting ready to do in this place. Have your way, oh God, and I release your presence in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You take your seats. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. And I want to share this brief word with you this morning. And uh, we're, we're, let me bring some context uh, to the text that we have read today. You see, the children of Israel, as was stated in the scripture, they are they have exited Egypt and they are now getting ready to move into the promised land or they are inhabiting the promised land, so to speak. And there are some enemies that have risen up against the children of Israel. And this is not uncommon in the Bible. There are various scriptures where we see the children of Israel fighting against various ites and various enemies who did not like them. They were jealous of them and they fought against them or they just hated God and they rose up against them. This is not uncommon. This is very, very common in the history of the children of Israel. But what is very specific about the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, what's, what's specific about these enemies is that previously before they decided to attack the children of Israel, the children of Israel had an opportunity to invade them and get rid of them or wipe them out or simply attack them and weaken them in advance before these enemies had an opportunity to turn around and then attack the children of Israel. Maybe if Israel had moved on this decision to go and attack these people who are now their enemies, perhaps they could have at least weaken them to the point where they would not pose a threat at such a crucial moment. This is a crucial moment for the children of Israel. They are inheriting the promised land. This is a, a thousand year promise that has been coming to pass finally and now the very people that they had mercy on are now the very same ones that are coming to them in a merciless mindset that are coming to destroy them and pull them out of the promises of God and we may have found ourselves at a point in our lives where there are some people okay. that we may have dealt with in the past who we could have told them about themselves. We, we could have put them out of the house earlier. We could have broken off ties with them. We could have chosen not to lend them money and help them out when they were in a poor state. We could have chosen to shun them. We could have chosen to withhold mercy. But the Spirit of God within us showed us that we're truly saved, not just yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit came and said, no, have mercy on them. Yeah. Don't, don't tell, don't give them a piece of your mind. Just give them peace. Be a peacemaker. Don't yeah. hold an opportunity to bless them. Bless them and, and give them something good. Let them feel good about themselves. No, don't, don't put them out just yet. Let them stay a little while. Let them get back on their feet. Help them out a little bit. And you do all that you can do to help them. And when you think you're going to reap a reward for your good works, it turns around and it's not the people that you have mistreated. It's, it's not the people that you may have walked past or forgotten about, but it's the very same people that you extended mercy to that are coming to you today and, and trying to knock the very wind out of you. It's the same people that you were benevolent to that are spreading rumors how selfish you are and how when they needed help you forgot about them and now you're all big and bad and all about yourself and you don't remember them anymore but it's the same people that you helped that often end up 
Can somebody say the eyes? The eyes. The eyes have it. They have it. And the worst part is you start to get to a point where you want to look at God funny and say, well, God, maybe if I didn't do that thing, maybe if I had attacked the situation when I had a chance, maybe if I had paid off that debt instead of giving this seed offering, I wouldn't be in debt right now. Maybe if I paid for my car instead of giving it to the building of the church, maybe I would still have a car right now. Maybe if I had told them about themselves and rebuked them when I had the chance, they wouldn't have had an opportunity or at least when they tried to hurt me, they would have had a reason to do so. God, I don't understand. Why did you put us in this compromising position? God, we had every opportunity to destroy them when we came out of Egypt. We could have done it then, but you told us to wait. You told us to bypass them. And now here they are again, God. Here they are again. And you see, you start to look at God funny, but it's not an issue about not having enough faith. You see, it's okay to ask these type of questions when you get into these situations, when you simply don't understand why. This is not a symptom of a lack of faith. It's just a symptom of living long enough, you see. Because if you live long enough, sooner or later you will find yourself at this place. But the question is, what do we do? When we get here, when we feel as though we follow Jesus into the water like Peter and we start to sink. You see, the issue with your faith is about guarding your gaze. Tell somebody, guard your gaze. You see, you've got to stop looking around at the circumstance. You have to stop looking at it at the surface level. Because God has a higher vantage point than you. He sees the full story. He sees the beginning and the end. He wrote the movie and he knows which part is coming next. Spoiler alert. So guard your gaze. Stop looking back on the way things could have been. You see, verse 17 of this same portion of scripture that we read, if you go on a little further, it says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The salvation is the same as receiving the experience of the salvation. Being able to see it is the same as being able to receive it. You see, the eyes have what you need. Tell your neighbor, the eyes have what you need. Because you see, it does not matter what your eyes are on. It matters what you get your eyes up on. Because the scripture says, our eyes are up on thee. You see, there's a difference because you can't help what your eyes are on. You can't help what comes into your frame of vision. But you can fix your focus such that you focus past what is in front of you and focus on the faith that God is trying to bring you today. Let me help somebody this morning. Your eyes may be upon, may be on that bill that seems like you can't pay. But if you get your eyes upon the provision of God, he will help pull you through it. I know your eyes may be on these kids that can't seem to get themselves together. But if you can get your, your eyes upon God's word that says, if you train the child up in the way that they should go, they will not depart from it. You see, you've got to get your eyes up on something. You see, your eyes may be on this doctor's report that say, I have breast cancer, or they're saying you have this disease or that disease. But my eyes are up on the word of God that says, by his stripes I'm healed. What are your eyes up on this morning? Uh -huh. <laughs> Men and women of God who are waiting on the right one and trying to get married such as myself, your eyes may be on that tight dress or that red dress. Or ladies, your eyes may be on that tight shirt showing every detail of every muscle. But my eyes are up on my future and I can't afford to give away. I can't afford to make a decision past the shame that will ruin the next 10 years of my life. What are your eyes up on? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Your eyes may be on the news and see what's going on in the White House and see what's happening in our communities, in our inner city communities, and what's going on with terrorism across the world. But your eyes need to be upon your redemption for it joy. Now, I wish somebody would lift their eyes up. I wish somebody would lift their eyes up and get your eyes up on something today. Come on, tell your neighbor you need to get up on this. You need to get up on you need to elevate, elevate your gaze and guard your gaze in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tell somebody the eyes have it. Uh -huh. And so I want to introduce to you two simple concepts.
today that will serve as the crux of our message as we attempt to see how the eyes have it, how the eyes have it. And the first thing I want to put to you today is that it, it may sound like an antithesis to faith. It may sound like something that opposes the very notion of faith, but I want you to just say this with me and I'm going to break it down for you and show you how this is an act of faith. And it's seeing is believing. Uh -huh. Seeing is believing. And that's the first thing I want to deal with today. Seeing is believing. It sounds like an antithesis to faith because we may think of the story of Thomas in the Bible. The disciple Thomas, when Jesus made his reappearance after he had come back from the grave and overcame death and sin. And he was in the room with the disciples and he was telling them who he was. But approaches this disciple named Thomas who said, Lord, I will not believe unless I can put my hands in the wounds and feel your hands and, and feel the, the side where the sword pierced through you. And Jesus allowed him to do that. And in that, Thomas's faith was increased. But Jesus turned and said to him, you have believed because you have seen, but blessed those who have not seen yet believed. But you see, what Jesus was talking about was about the physical seeing. If, if you don't see it in the physical and believe, greater is your faith than those that have seen the promise manifest in the physical and then believe. But I want to challenge you today that you still need to see in order to believe. But it's not with physical eyes that you need to see. It is with your spiritual eyes that you need to capture the vision before you see it in the natural. You see, your belief is always directed towards where you're looking. You always look to what you believe. That's why seeing is believing. If you trust in the White House to fulfill all your needs and help you in your state, you will look to them. You will run to them. You will run to CNN and see what the latest report is, what this politician is saying. You will run and see what the latest debate is about because that's what you believe in. If you believe that your bank account is what's going to sustain you and keep you, you are going to constantly check your balance. You're going to constantly look and see where I can get money, what I can do to work overtime. You're always looking, looking, looking towards what you believe can help you. But you see, if you can't see it, huh, then you can't believe it. Uh -huh. Because where you're looking to is what you believe in. And I believe that this coincides with the scripture that declares where there is no vision, the people perish. So you must have something in your line of sight in order to believe and move forward. You see, seeing is believing. And as I was preparing this word today, the Holy Spirit actually dropped in this special part for just for New and Living Way. It was not a part of the original text. And I want to share with you New and Living Way. I want to share with you, Pastor Shannon, and encourage you today. I don't know what it is that you may be waiting on to take the next step with this ministry to move it to the next level. I hear it. I heard it in my spirit that there's something that's being waited upon to, to get that release to move to the next stage. But I want to encourage you in the Holy Spirit today to move now with what you have. Move now with what you have. You don't have to wait for that thing. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it may be. The next thing that you're anticipating or waiting on the Lord to do in order for you to move to the next stage. But I want to encourage this ministry. Move, take the big leap with what seems small. Take the big leap with what may seem small in your hand. You see, it's not that we don't have what we need. It's that we sometimes don't see what we already have. Because we have, we have a concept of provision. We believe that we're waiting on God's provision to come into our lives before we can move. But if you actually break down the word provision, dealing with the first word, pro. Pro means that you're particularly good at something to the point where it may not be as challenging to you as other people. You have amateur sports, then you have pro sports. You have pro baseball and pro basketball. They're particularly good at what they do. And then we have the word vision. We all understand what that word means. It means to be able to see. So provision isn't actually being supplied with something that you don't see yet. Provision is your ability to see what you already have in place. You have provision. I'm a pro at seeing what I already have. And I want to encourage and I want to speak this into this ministry. God reveal what is already here that will take this ministry to the next level. Lord, we don't need to wait on the next big thing to come before we move, but I'm going to see the small thing as the new and living way to the next 
Isaac. Well, God will send the sacrifice. What if he had just waited on that ram? What if he had just never taken an act of faith, taking a leap of faith with the small word that God had given him? You see, Abraham had become accustomed to moving in God without getting very much in terms of instruction. So he took that little strategy that he had been using his whole life, took a leap of faith, and God blessed him. Look at Moses standing in front of the Red Sea, and he looked unto God to say, the mountains are surrounding us. The army is chasing us down. The Red Sea is in front of us. What are we going to do? Perhaps we would have expected Moses to wait for some boats to come and pick up the children of Israel. Perhaps we were waiting for God to send the chariots of fire to leap them over the Red Sea and take out the army of Egypt. But no, God asked him, what do you have in your hand? And he was able to see the staff that was already there. What if King David or King Elect David had waited for God to supply him with a sword in order to defeat Goliath? No, he wasn't going to wait on a sword. He didn't need the armor. But David used what he had and he was able to slay a giant and I want to encourage you because this does not mean God is not going to send that big thing your way because Abraham acted on faith and he did receive the ram. Moses looked to the staff and they did go through the Red Sea. David used his sling and he still received the sword from the giant. So I'm encouraging this ministry today and at your provision and see what God is doing right now. In Jesus name. Y'all got y'all to give God praise for it. Come on, I said y'all to give God praise for it. Seeing. Seeing is believing. Tell somebody the eyes. The eyes. Come on, you're not making your eyes big enough. The eyes. Have it. Uh-huh. But not only is seeing believing, we've defined seeing as believing, but now we need to define believing. But you see, believing, uh uh-huh, catch this, believing is agreeing. Belief means to come into agreement with. So not only is seeing believing, but believing is an act of agreement. You see, this is exactly how our present day justice system works or ought to work. You see, it's not really what we believe to be right and wrong in court. It's what we we believe enough to agree with to be right and wrong. Are you sharing enough with with me that I can agree with my fellow jury members that this man is guilty or not guilty? It's about what we can come into agreement with. You see, faith is not necessarily about how strongly you believe in something or how how passionately you believe in something. It's your ability to come into agreement with the word of God. That's what faith is. Do you have the ability to come into agreement with the word of God? Are you willing to trust the word of God or trust your own beliefs? No, faith is about agreeing with God's word. And I want to share with you today And this is going to be where we're going home in our message. And I want to share with you today how believing is agreeing. You see, I want to give a little history lesson here about an old procedure that was characteristic of previous centuries of British parliamentary rule and procedure. I want to explain to you today what is known as the division of assembly. You see, this will be their form of Congress. Uh, back in the day when they used to wear those crazy wigs, or you may have seen them in your history books, this old school, you may have seen them in paintings, how the parliament used to break down different decisions that they would make, whether it was voting somebody into a, a, a level of office, whether it would be voting on a new rule or a new law that would be enacted into the country. You see, in the division of assembly, they didn't have any private votes. There was no written ballots that people would write down on and put them into a box that would be reviewed at another time. Every single agreement was made openly. Everyone who agreed with what was going on, they would stand and they would raise their hand and they would indicate so verbally. And I want to challenge us today. Do you have a private faith or a public faith? Huh? Do you have a private faith or a public faith? You ought to have both of them. 
Because what you do in the private ought to come out into the light. Are we, are we scared to share our faith? Are we scared to stand and say we agree with God's word? Or when the time comes for us to be challenged, do we back up into a corner and act like we don't know who God is? Because you see, this agreement has to be a public agreement. That's part of the reason why we have the ministry of baptism. Because it's a public agreement that I am entering in. I've entered into a faith relationship with the Holy God. But you see, in the division of assembly, this is how it would work. Whenever somebody asked a question about what was ever on the table, somebody would stand up, they would raise their hand, and make a vocal declaration by either saying yes or no. But back in this 17th, 16th, 15th century English, they didn't say the words yes or no. They would say maybe yay or nay. But if you go back a little bit further, the actual words they would use would be no or I, spelled A-Y-E, which also means yes. You see, God needs to see where you stand. That's why he puts you in these situations to see whether you are going to waver or you're going to walk in faith. And God today wants to see where you stand. So at this time, I want this sanctuary to be transformed into a division of assembly today. And we have a few items on the docket this morning, and I want to see where the people of God stand. So what I'm going to do, Pastor, I'm going to read a few things on this docket. We got a few things on the table that we need to see about and vote on this morning. So if you're in agreement with the things that are being declared, I want you to make a physical declaration by standing up and saying the word I if you agree or no if you disagree. Do we understand what we're doing here this morning? So I want to call this assembly into order. And I want to call the delegates of the children of God to their seats today. And we have a few items on the list that we need to talk about. So again, if you agree, stand and declare I. And if you disagree, stand and declare no. So the first docket we have today for review is if you refuse to be afraid or dismayed by reason of this great multitude, stand and say I.
feels clouded. You see, the thing about eyes is they're very sensitive. I know this because I wear contacts and I had to put them in this morning. And if you have the slightest speck of dust on a contact, if there's the slightest bit of oil residue or a hair or a dust gets on there, you feel it, it's sensitive. And there are some people that have tried to scratch your eyes. I see it. Some people that have tried to poke your eyes out and stop you from seeing what God is getting ready to do. But I, I believe that the optometrist is in the building today to fix your vision, to perform some LASIK surgery in this place, to open the eyes, not the physical eyes, but the eyes of your heart, that you can receive God's vision, his provision today. I want to invite you here. Can I pray with you? Can I pray with you this morning? That God would fix our vision and fix our eyes upon him today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe it's because you don't know the Lord why you don't have the vision to see what God is presenting to you. I want to invite you this morning to the altar and let us pray with you. Let us pray with you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Come, come and have your vision. Jesus specialized in opening up blinded eyes. Opening up clouded eyes. He did it in so many ways. You may think, there's no way that I can recover from this, Jesus. There's no way that I can unsee what was done in order to move towards what's ahead. But God is getting ready to transform your vision this morning. Come on, is there someone else today? Is there another one today? Come let God fix your vision today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit. Do a work in this place. Holy Spirit, open up blinded eyes in this place. Hallelujah. Open up blinded eyes in this place, Lord. All we need to do is see you. If you can just catch a glimpse, the scripture said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord.